This is Mark Sobel. I'm the U.S. Chair of OMFIF. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by three outstanding panelists for a discussion of U.S.-China relations. First, Dave Rank. Dave served in the U.S. Foreign Service for 27 years with multiple stints in China, including as Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy, a post in which he ran the day-to-day -day operations, and he was also the Chargé d'Affaires for six months. He's now a senior advisor with the Cone Group, a global business consulting group of former high-level officials led by former Defense Secretary William Cone. Stephanie Siegel is a longtime close colleague and friend. She worked many years at the U.S. Treasury, including as director of the Asia office. She also worked in the IMF. She's now a senior fellow with the CSIS Economics Program, where she often writes about economics in China. Gerwin Bell is a principal lead economist for Asia on the global macroeconomic research team at PGIM Fixed Income. He also served many years as an official at the IMF uh, and was a mission chief in the Europe department. So welcome. Um, let's look into US-China relations from a geostrategic perspective, some of the non-macroeconomic areas of economic interaction, such as trade, technology, and state capitalism. Uh, and we'll turn to macro issues. Um, I'm gonna try and organize our discussion in two rounds, uh, three to four minutes each. Um, I'll then uh, turn to the audience questions, which can be submitted via the uh, Q&A function. Uh, in the first round, I'd like to focus on how US-China relations have evolved to the present and identify the current challenges facing the Biden administration. And the second round, we can talk about what the administration will need to do. Let me start with Dave. Um, so first of all, congratulations on a distinguished career as one of America's foremost diplomats and China experts. Uh, it's a great honor to have you today. You've seen a lot in your career, tremendous growth, which raised China to the world's second largest economy, a period in which America worked to integrate China into the global order, and then one in which US-China relations have become fraught and where the entire US political spectrum views China seemingly as a hostile competitor. It strikes me that China changed a lot under President Xi. Uh, the Obama administration was far darker about China in its second term, I recall that. Um, Trump, very dark, wanted to go alone, took a belligerent stance. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the evolution of diplomacy over this period. Um, what do we get right and wrong? It seems there's tensions burbling forward everywhere we look. Um, what are our big challenges now in dealing with China? And uh, at some point today, I'm gonna ask you if we're being too confrontational in our dealings with China. So over to you, Dave. Okay, thanks. Uh, tall order for three or four minutes, but I will, uh, let, let, me, let me see what I can squeeze in. Uh, you're absolutely, first of all, it's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation, Mark. Uh, it is a uh, great organization and, and uh, it's a real honor. Uh, your point that China changed under Xi, it's absolutely true that, that uh, 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 the China under Xi, uh, of Xi Jinping's era is different than uh, in the past. But I think it's important to remember that Xi Jinping uh, is not the embodiment of China, just like Donald Trump is not the embodiment of the United States or was not the embodiment of the United States. I think they both reflect an important element of, of uh, the countries they led, uh, or in, in, in the case of Xi, uh, continues to lead. Uh, but a, there are many, many other uh, currents uh, uh, in that country. Uh, the, the big difference, of course, is that elections have consequences, that our election changed our leadership. And in China, the lack of elections also has consequences, which is we are uh, almost certain to see Xi Jinping as the leader of China for a, 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 a uh, 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 a long time, and that my personal view is when we read, you know, when we come to the end of the Xi Jinping era, uh, we're due for, uh, we're very likely to see a, a crisis of transition uh, because of the the sort of mechanisms uh, to to move from one leader to the next uh, have been sort of uh, kicked kicked to the curb. But that's for uh, probably a future discussion. Uh, you're right, uh, U.S.-China relations uh, and our, our policy towards China has evolved a lot. My first assignment in China was, oh my gosh, more than 30 years ago. I uh, went to Shanghai in 1990, uh, the year after the Tiananmen massacre, 
Uh, that year, the United States obliterated uh, the Iraqi army uh, in, in Operation Desert Storm. Uh, the, that fall, the, the uh, Berlin Wall fell. The, the next year, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. So, uh, you know, uh, arrived at a moment of real transition and, and uh, um, the emergence of a unipolar world, essentially. Uh, uh, and China was at, 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 uh, uh, exceedingly weak at that point, and its leverage to negotiate was, was extremely uh, uh, low. And I think that leverage is an important concept to keep in mind as you think about American diplomacy and its evolution uh, in, in China. Uh, you talked about human rights briefly, and I think that's a, a, a probably a useful uh, a prism to look at the idea of leverage. You know, 1990, uh, we, uh, our engagement, our diplomacy on human rights with China you know, the, to some extent, it was a list of asks. Hey, there are, you know, these dissidents, we'd like you to re release them. Uh, uh, and China grudgingly, didn't like to do it, but grudgingly uh, uh, agreed in some cases, uh, released dissidents. Uh, many of them are now living in the West, in the United States and Europe. Uh, you know, jump forward 20 years, China was much less willing to listen to those sorts of requests by, you know, by the early 2000s, uh, very rarely uh, would they uh, accede to requests. Uh, uh, and, and jump forward to today, where we see that leverage shifting again as China's overall heft has grown. Uh, and instead of not, uh, just not listening to re requests for uh, uh, the, the kinds of requests we made in the past, they're now also making requests of their own that not only will they not listen to American requests, but they're actively going to the United States, going to the rest of the world saying, not only will we not listen to your requests, but we're we expect you to not talk about these issues. You saw that most pointedly uh, uh, with Xinjiang uh, just in the past week. Uh, the big turning points, I would say 2008, the global financial crisis. Uh, and, and I think you all have been very deeply involved in that. I think at that point, the Chinese, sort of uh, took on board that, uh, you know, their, it really shook their faith, their confidence, and their willingness to, uh, to listen to uh, Western economic uh, advice. And then just this past year, uh, the Western American European mishandling of the pandemic uh, sort of ratified in not just uh, Beijing's minds, but a lot of ordinary Chinese minds, uh, the shortcomings of the, uh, of the Western political model as well. So what are the big challenges? I got to say the first big challenge is climate, not just the, uh, the, the uh, you know, how do we deal with what is the existential threat uh, to everyone on this planet? Uh, and so, you know, how are the United States and China going to deal with that issue uh, and, and make the kind of progress we need uh, to protect the planet? But also how do you prevent it from getting uh, gummed up with all of the other issues in the relationship? The next big issue is tech. To what extent are we going to dis decouple? And I think we're going to decouple our tech ecosystems to some degree, but will it be comprehensive or will it be targeted at a number of technologies that both sides recognize are truly uh, uh, essential to national security? Uh, the next one is sort of broader on trade and, and you know, all of the issues that weren't in the phase one uh, trade agreement between the United States and China, which is to say most of the really tough ones. Uh, and then finally security. And I think that the challenge for the United States is how to not go down the route of throwing money at the issue. There's a tendency and it's probably easiest in the US system when faced with a security challenge to just give the Department of Defense more money. And given the geography where, uh, you know, the challenge we have with China, we are thousands and thousands of miles away from a challenge that's right in China's backyard. Uh, that's a recipe for uh, sort of spending ourselves to ruin. So I'll stop there. Uh, I think I've gone past my four minutes, uh, but it really tough set of complex issues. Thank you. Yes, China's definitely complicated. Uh, you reminded me in, uh, in the global financial crisis, I was speaking to uh, some of the Chinese regulators and uh, they very much told me, we used to see ourselves as a student, but we now no longer want to listen to the teacher. Um, Stephanie, uh, you know, building on what Dave was speaking about, let's, let's turn to maybe some of the non-macroeconomic uh, financial issues such as trade and technology. As Dave mentioned, there's talk about splinter net and decoupling. Uh, the last administration deployed uh, tariffs, used entities lists, sanctions, et cetera. You know, and uh, as Dave said, uh, he, Trump, 
despite phase one, didn't really get at the phase two issues as we call them about forced technology transfer, um, excessive government industrial policy, uh, state capitalism, et cetera. So just any thoughts uh, for us on where we stand? What are the big problems uh, that we're gonna be looking at? Yeah, well, first, um, thanks for the invitation. It's always nice to see you, even if it's on a screen. Um, I think um, the, the way that the Biden administration has framed the US-China relationship um, and the kind of uh, the narrative here that there are areas where we will compete. Um, there are the areas of confrontation and then there are areas of potential cooperation. I think, um, I think that's the right framing. Um, I actually don't see that there's a huge divergence necessarily from the diagnosis that the Biden administration brings to the US-China relationship vis-a-vis -vis the Trump administration, but the approach, the kind of tactical approach that the administration will take when it comes to working with China, I think that's where we will see a big difference. Um, specifically, the, the diagnosis, you kind of um, alluded to the, the tensions that exist in the relationship um, and in particular in the trade realm and areas of technology competition that, that Dave mentioned, um, that remains, I think, the, the same diagnosis. There's not a lot of difference there. Um, the question is what you do about it. And here I see the administration trying to avoid some of the pitfalls of the Trump administration and specifically the fact that the Chinese, I think, identified daylight between different agencies and between different equities um, and tried to kind of leverage that distance. Um, I see the Biden administration um, taking much more of a whole of government approach, trying to get um, agreement on what are our objectives when it comes to engaging with China and then going into engagement with China with everyone on the same page, at least to the extent they can be on the same page, and only after coordinating internally and externally with allies and partners, right? And we saw a very clear demonstration of this um, leading up to the Anchorage meeting. That meeting only took place um, after the, the Quad meeting with um, Japan, Australia, and India. And it took place after meetings with Japanese counterparts and with South Korean counterparts. So um, the sequencing here, I think, is really important. <laughs> um, and I don't think it's just uh, for presentation's sake. I think there's a realization that when trying to engage with China, and exactly as Dave said, you know, China in 2021 is not China in 1990. And the ability to go in and kind of dictate <laughs> terms is, uh, is long gone. So the only chance of being effective in getting China to either change behavior, to you know, agree to discipline itself on state subsidies, for instance, is going to be through multilateral pressure and you've got to build that consensus first before the engagement. And so I, I think that's kind of the tactical approach that the administration wants to take. Um, I also think that's a lot easier said than done. So, you know, have, having those meetings, having that conversation, that of course is essential, but um, there are tensions, to be honest, when it comes to, you know, the US and Europe, for instance, on trade. Um, so it's it's going to be a challenge to actually get there, but I think that is the intention going in. Great. Well, hopefully uh, later on we'll be able to assess uh, the question of if the U.S. leads, will others follow? Um, uh, Gerwin, maybe you could share with us some thoughts on the Chinese macro situation and outlook. Uh, tremendous growth in China, tremendous accomplishments, um, managed well the pandemic. Um, but we often talk about the transition, the China's, China's need to transition from investment intensive led growth to consumerism and services. Um, and when I look at the savings and investment data for China, it doesn't seem that 
that's happening all that quickly. Um, and it seems that China kind of doubled down on the old uh, state-led growth model uh, in, in part to overcome the pandemic, though the authorities are sensitive about leverage and whatnot. So what do you see as the big challenges facing China now on the macro front? And we'll come back to how to address them in round two. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Mark. And, uh, and, and I think uh, you're, you're spot on in, in, in your assessment. Thanks first for having me in uh, on such a, a distinguished panel. Now, the first thing I think to keep in mind um, is to not look at the uh, at the growth numbers that, that that pop up right now or even popped up last year on, on GDP growth. That those reflect a very imbalanced situation. Now, the whole rest of the world is also uh, imbalanced, reflecting uh, uh, the pandemic and, and lockdown policies. And in the first instance, China really was able to benefit from the uh, uh, developed market uh, policies of, of very strict lockdowns, shutting down production early on, whereas China and, and insulating consumption by income transfers um, that actually kept household income and spending power up. And China actually very early on opening factories, keeping them open and supplying the uh, this, this developed market demand. Now, what has that has left China in, in a very interesting uh, situation uh, with respect to their long-term trends. It's, it's become very imbalanced, as I said, but it's also reversed some of the, uh, the progress toward the uh, rebalancing they had. So we have, if we look at last year, it's an industrial manufacturing sector driven uh, 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 return and rebound. It's been driven by property investment and it's driven by exports. So the very different from the uh, consumption upgrading, dual circulation that the, uh, the leadership in Xi Jinping had us believe was on the agenda. So it's a massive step back, plus they landed with higher debt because once again, uh, property and, and infrastructure investment. So they have, um, they do have their, uh, their, their work cut out on that. On top of that, we have also seen uh, in, in, in the West, we have this inflation debate uh, for why. So the, in, 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 in China, on the consumer price index, we are deep into deflationary moment. That's a reflection of how poorly uh, consumption and domestic demand are actually doing. So not only are they not the leading growth driver, they're actually holding things massively back. Um, now, that's not something I tell you. I mean, it's something I tell you, but it's something that the leadership tell you too. And, and I think a lot of Western analysts were very surprised by, uh, by the sort of the somber notes that uh, uh, emerged from the NPC. And not a, not a week goes by without some macroeconomic policymaker telling you that we have to be very, very cautious, uh, if at all, in withdrawing stimulus. So China is really fighting a somewhat rearguard uh, action uh, in order to claim back some of the progress in rebalancing and, 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 and progress toward domestic demand, they actually had there. One reflection of this, and I think this is also something that people tend to miss, we have, we don't really have a growth target this year, we have a growth flaw of 6%. What does the 6% growth flaw mean? Well, we're talking about an annual average growth number. Now, if you just look at the, uh, the carryover effect, namely the, the annualized fourth quarter outturn and compare that over the average of, uh, of, of, of 2020, we already have 6%. So that growth flaw tells us the Chinese authorities really don't want to see a shrinking economy. That's not very ambitious. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 the takeaway I take from this is that they're very aware that they're slipping on their near-term agenda, even the rebalancing dual circulation, greater independence agenda, and they want to carve out these very favorable, very flattering base effect driven growth numbers this year to really claw back on some of the uh, progress they have achieved in the past. Well, thank you for that. I've noticed that too, that uh, you know most of the forecasts for China are in the eight to 9% range. And I took the 6% floor as a sign that um, they, they were signaling their concerns about leverage in the economy and that they wanted to run restrained macro policy. Um, so Dave, uh, 
Blinken Sullivan meeting took place in Alaska, as Stephanie was just mentioning. Uh, we saw we saw the photos from out from the opening, but we didn't really know what happened in the room. Um, how much of the opening do you think was playing up to domestic audiences, um, both sides, and necessitated by um, probably a concern in the Biden team that uh, they're going to be attacked from the Republican Party about being soft on China versus just reflecting a genuine shift in uh, US views. Um, and uh, more generally, if you could amplify on uh, what you think Biden needs to do to address some of the challenges you identified earlier and um, over to you. Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, absolutely, I think both sides were mugging for the cameras uh, at, in, in, uh, in Anchorage what, a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the underlying uh, uh, sort of spirit wasn't there already. That you know, there's a very contentious relationship, uh, and and I think everyone knew going in. I think the Americans, you know, if you look at the composition of the Biden uh, administration foreign policy team, uh, there's a lot of carryover from the Obama administration, and I think part of, uh, at least subconsciously, had to be a recollection of early in the Obama administration. President Obama goes to Copenhagen in, I think it was December, late 2009, one of his early trips. Uh, and, and really, uh, you know, this was uh, the, the sort of receipt, the common take is that the Chinese were sort of testing Obama for, for weakness and that he didn't do very well. Uh, you know, he goes into this, this uh, high level meeting uh, trying to hammer out a deal uh, on climate in Copenhagen. Uh, and the Chinese, and I say this from a position as a low level bureaucrat, uh, 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 for my career, is the Chinese send in a low-level bureaucrat, a guy at about my level, as uh, uh, Obama's counterpart in this final meeting, uh, and sort of really a calculated public effort to say, you know, to send a message early on in the in the Obama administration. I can't help but think that that had an influence on on the Biden folks as they went in for their first high-level meeting uh, face to face uh, uh, with the Chinese. I, I think I, I'm. I think obviously given politics in Washington, uh, the Biden team is, is concerned about being attacked as being you know, kind of too soft on China. But in fact, as Stephanie, I think you, you, I mean, it's one of the things that there's pretty good, strong consensus on in Washington. Uh, and, and there's not actually a lot of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats on China policy right now. And there's not even that much difference between the Biden uh, take on, on China and the Trump uh, view in a lot of areas. I kind of see it as Trumpism without the regime change, that the Biden administration isn't talking about, you know, we have to get rid of the, the uh, Communist Party of China. I, Biden team recognizes that that's a fact of life. We may not like the CCP, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they're a force that has to be uh, dealt with. Uh, and for the most part, and, you know, getting back to it's interesting that we're both talking about leverage, uh, you know, diplomatic leverage and financial leverage. Uh, I think the Biden's take on how do you have a strong China policy is you have to go back to basics. And a lot of that is to, to build up our own leverage, domestically getting our act in order. I mean, the, the diagnosis of the problem uh, from the US side and the Chinese side is not that far apart that both recognize that the problems, both political and economic in the US system. And I think the Biden team is focused on, on getting that right. Uh, and then also, Stephanie, to your point, building up leverage uh, uh, with our, our allies and partners. I don't think Tony Blinken has a, a to-do list on his table. And now having had a couple of meetings with Europeans, he's got a check mark done, fix the US uh, 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 EU alliance. There's a lot of work to be done there still, uh, but I think that's, uh, that's what they're uh, uh, headed for. I will say uh, one thing that came out of uh, Alaska and the, the immediate follow-on that the Chinese, I think, overreaction to the EU and US sanctions by slapping sanctions on American and particularly EU officials, uh, which has endangered, I think, critically the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment between the EU and China, uh, which will go a long way uh, to uh, helping at least Tony Blinken and his checklist uh, in, in strengthening that relationship. Great, great. Um... So you think there's hopes that Europe will follow uh, American leadership thanks to Chinese uh, missteps? I, I think uh, if the vision is lockstep, the EU and the United States, uh, uh, sort of uh, the EU uh, taking notes as Joe Biden describes what, what he wants them to do, I, that's not where we're headed. You know, if, 
a, a, a Washington that is able to listen to European concerns and, and, a, and adopt and adjust a strategy uh, that reflects American interests, but also EU interests and gets at the sort of irritants in the bilateral uh, American in the transatlantic uh, uh, relationship, uh, a, a two-way uh, dialogue. Uh, I, I'm somewhat optimistic on that. Great. Um, well, Stephanie, can you amplify in your first round comments and tell us about, um, do you really, uh, do you see Biden, as Dave was just suggesting, Biden isn't all that dissimilar from Trump in certain respects? Entities, lists, sanctions, um, uh, tariffs here for a while. I mean, what, what's your overall take? And can we tackle some of these uh, phase two uh, uh, issues. Um, so over to you. Yeah, I and actually just if I could um, comment on what Dave just said, I, I agreed there were two things that I, I wanted to just um, kind of underscore the US position in negotiating with China, kind of dependent on coordination with allies. And then I think as he was alluding to negotiating from a position of strength, including economic strength. So a lot of the the push for additional stimulus here, I think, you know, first and foremost for domestic reasons and to fuel the recovery, but it doesn't hurt <laughs> to be in a strong economic position in entering into these negotiations. And then the, the point that he raised on, on Europe, and I think maybe a miscalculation on the part of the, the Chinese um, in, in pushing back. I actually heard a, a, a Europe expert, my respect very much, say just the other day that um, she sees no uh, no chance that the agreement, the, the comprehensive investment agreement is actually not viable in Europe anymore because of the strong pushback against, um, against uh, Chinese actions. So I just wanted to uh, add my um, agreement with his, his points there on um, what the Biden administration will do kind of in specific areas. And I think you mentioned technology. Um, so the Biden administration has inherited a lot from the Trump administration. Um, and you mentioned the, um, the sanctions, some of the entity, uh, the um, entities on the entity list. Um, but uh, you know, the list of actions that it inherited where it will have to decide what it will do is, is long. It includes um, the, the divestiture um, of, uh, of um, TikTok, it includes um, an executive order on uh, a number of Chinese apps. Um, it includes uh, the, um, the um, prevention of investment, US investment in Chinese military companies. So there is a, a long list there that they will have to react to. I, I think um, USTR Tai um, made news when she said that you know the US will not be taking off the tariffs. I think that that headline I think is probably going to be carried through across a number of these other initiatives. So I don't think we should expect the Biden uh, administration to take. Uh, a softer tact when it comes to China, unless it is warranted by the broader strategy. And, and I'll go back to kind of one of the tactical differences in this administration, I think, is coordinating across agencies, actually articulating what are the objectives of this policy, of a policy, and what are the chances of that policy actually succeeding. I think that is the right way to go. Um, and when we think about the effectiveness of any one of these actions, effectiveness also has to include the legality of actions. So a few of the, the executive orders that I mentioned before have been subject to legal challenges. And at least on a preliminary basis, some of those challenges have actually resulted in the action being, being stalled. So um, Imposing something that is later unwound in US courts actually undermines our credibility. So I do expect the administration to be very careful about defining objectives, having policy actions that are consistent with achieving the objectives. And part of that analysis has to be the legality of the action. And if it doesn't pass legal muster, then we need to back away from it for our own credibility's sake. 
Thank you for that. Um, uh, Gerwin, um, maybe you could briefly tell us uh, a subject that would take hours to discuss, but very quickly, um, <laughs> can China manage its ca challenges over the coming decade? I'm, I'm of the school of thought that says there's given leverage and huge transitional problems, there's gonna be some nasty bumps in the road, but uh, I don't know if you agree with that. I, I do, and, 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 and I actually, I can't put it up here, but uh, I just did a paper where I, I, I looked at the, uh, the longer term um, GDP and, and economic dominance outlook on China. And it's, I mean, this story that, you know, China is GDP will overtake the US is, is, is far from clear. And, uh, and the Chinese are very aware. Of so there are two reasons for this. One is uh, demographics. Um, there's not much we can do about this. I mean, the, uh, the, the one child policy has now done permanent damage and they can try to roll it back, but it, it is, it's private sector behavior uh, in the bedroom, which is not, um, not really amendable to political pressure. The second thing is productivity. Now, what, what we've seen in China is, you mentioned it earlier, massive increases in investment, but they have not really led in, into, into significant productivity increases. And another really important reading in that respect is the, uh, uh, our former employer, the, uh, uh, the IMF, just did the Article 4 report on, on China. And you can see a, a fairly challenging picture where you know, China is about still only 30% of the global, global production possibility frontier and has actually slipped back in recent years. Why have they slipped back? Because of an emphasis, an emphasis on, on state-led uh, and, and, and state-owned uh, companies in, in the development model. So they have their work cut out and, uh, and they know it. So that, that, in my mind, that is the point behind these China uh, 2025 technological upgrading initiatives. It's an up, it's an effort from the top to get productivity growth going. Um, now, I'm, I'm as cheery an economist as, as they are as they're out there, but I mean, the, the, the record on government-driven productivity growth is actually fairly, uh, fairly dismal one. Um, and so my first message, I mean, also to uh, national security people is, I mean, to just enjoy the relatively good position the U.S. are in. Um, and I think a, a, a key thing, and I, the, the Chinese are very well aware of this, and I'm, I'm afraid the U.S. audiences are not so well aware of it, um, the, this, this relatively good position that, that, that the U.S. find themselves. So key, key task uh, is... I mean, to, to keep on focusing on things that we are doing well. I mean, we, the U.S., I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a citizen, but what, what, what the U.S. are doing well, and, and particularly in areas where, where China has been very frustrated in, in catching up, such as aircraft engines, for instance, um, really complicated chip design, um, pyrotic fracturing. These were all private sector-driven uh, manufacturing areas where the U.S. is at the very edge of the global technology frontier, and notwithstanding uh, massive investment in, in in these areas, China finds it very hard to to catch up. So don't give up on what we do well. Second thing, don't try to replicate what what China does well with costs. And, and I was really, really struck by uh, a press conference last week on the, by the new um, US Transportation Secretary, Mayor Pete. I always have trouble with his last name, so I'm not going to pronounce it. Um, and, and he pronounced on the, uh, on, 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 on the new tunnel under the, uh, the, Hudson, the Hudson River. So it, it, it's very dear to my mind, our our, uh, our corporate headquarters is in Newark, New Jersey. I live in Manhattan. That's about your know, area distance, uh, uh, about uh, less than 10 mile uh, path, which now recently has taken one and a hour to two hours if you do by subway and train. Um, now there has been an Amtrak development for the last two decades to build like in essence, a, a three mile stretch of additional tunnel. Uh, we're still nowhere near there. And, and the latest take up is, uh, is an environmental review. Contrasted with the massive development of the, the Hong Kong Macau Highway via Zhuzhe, like 10 times the distance 
Um, it's been built in a time frame that we're still discussing this tunnel and uh, in, 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 at a much lower cost. We cannot do this. And one reason why we cannot do this is we don't, we cannot order infrastructure to be built front top. That is not how the country is set up. Uh, a second example is um, a solar and an and area where China did grab, uh, grab the, uh, the global uh, market share, but in the effort commoditized. It. So you, you remember uh, 12 years ago or so when, when we made an effort in the US or in Germany, my home country, to get on top of the, the solar value chain, that failed miserably. And the Chinese, by sheer amount of investment, took the sector, but guess what? It's not really uh, a very high value added, now commoditized sector. So I think as US, we have to keep a clear-eyed view that the this messy, this aggregated economic setup helps us to keep at the production possibility from the stretch it out. And, and, and that order key is bad. So one reason we are so good at chips is because we import them. If we were to manufacture every single supply chain component, I think we'd lose the ability to push things out. Well, great, interesting. I think there's a line, but there's also there's a contrast. Dave said earlier that uh, the U.S. needs to get his house in order. Uh, Biden's putting forward an infrastructure package. You're saying uh, government-led infrastructure projects don't necessarily work out all that well. Uh, we'll have to see how that all um, uh, plays out. Um, so um, I want to turn to Dave. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to do again to you. I'm just going to throw a bunch of questions your way and let you deal with them however you want. One is um, we're focused today on U.S. views of China, but China has views about us as well. Um, you know, is the U.S. sufficiently cognizant of those views? I'm sure from the embassy is in your days you do a great job, but is the body politic in America sufficiently cognizant of the views and able to in incorporate them intelligently into our strategic thinking or, um, and are we overdoing it on our side? Are we seeing China's overly hostile? You know, it's, it's big, it's there, we got to deal with it. We're very confrontational, but we need to engage in some respects. And so do we have the balance right? So that's my general question for you. Um, and since you mentioned climate at the beginning and just looking at the audience questions, um, COP26, COP um, Will the U.S. be trying to reassert its leadership there vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, China in terms of climate policy? Sure. Thanks. Uh, absolutely right. And, you know, the whole time we've been talking, I think all four of us have been very conscious of the fact that we are making a real uh, 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 sort of rhetorical mistake when we talk about China uh, because you know, it's 1.4 billion people. And sometimes we mean genuinely China, the entire entity of 1.4 billion people. You know, frequently we mean Beijing, you know, the, the state structure. But often we mean uh, the the CCP, you know, at the the, the the sort of ideological heart. And sometimes we mean Xi Jinping. You know, the, and all of those are distinct uh, 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 elements of a, a multifaceted challenge. I know within the U.S. government, people who look at, and I'm going to say it again, China. Uh, try to make those distinctions. And you saw the Trump administration trying to, you know, sort of cut off the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party from the rest of China said, you know, we don't, we're not anti-China, but we have real concerns about the, the CCP. They might even, even said we're anti-CCP. Uh, uh, but I think it is an important thing to keep in mind that, that uh, you know, China has been around a long time before the Communist Party uh, uh, was in charge. It will be around for a long time after Xi Jinping leaves the stage. Uh, and uh, you know th that there are lots of arguments we have with the Communist Party, uh, with policies of Xi Jinping, uh, but there are lots of areas of alignment uh, 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 with ordinary Chinese people. We still, uh, uh, pandemic notwithstanding, remain an extraordinarily popular place for Chinese people to send their children, which I think is a, is a, uh, a really important indicator uh, of a sort of the underlying current in the relationship. We'll see how that comes back after the pandemic, uh, now that we really are in a changed uh, environment. On COP26, I, I worked with John Kerry a little bit uh, when I was doing Afghanistan and stuff, and he spent, I mean, the guy has a ton of energy, 
Uh, he spent a, a huge amount of time uh, personally, uh, sort of uh, from Washington, and then traveling to Afghanistan when he was Secretary of State to hammer out a deal uh, between uh, 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 two factions within the government. Uh, he didn't come back into government uh, to uh, burnish his credentials. He came back to make to make a difference uh, on climate issues. Uh, and I think he also came back because he wants to reassert American leadership uh, at, at, in fora like COP26. I, I would be shocked if we really aren't pushing really, really hard. And I think the, the, the $2 billion infrastructure package plays into that, that he recognizes, Biden recognizes uh, that we can't just talk about this stuff. We have to put things on the table. And I think uh, a lot of that will be getting a package like what's under consideration. Uh, through the Congress. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, we're getting some questions in about uh, Biden trade agreements, uh, CPTP. I can't pronounce that one right. Too many acronyms here. Uh, views on RCEP. Um, where is, are the Chinese going to uh, truly join uh, CPTPP? Um, and, and also, if you have any views on uh, whether, and, and this can go to Ber Gerwin as well, along with some digital questions in a minute. Um, any views on further opening up of China's financial markets? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this has been, uh, this has been a question. Um, if the US is prioritizing working uh, with allies and partners, if it is prioritizing multilateral approaches, and in particular, if it wants to, um, to convince Asian allies and partners that the US uh, will be continue to be a, a strong presence in the region, the economic piece of that strategy um, requires our engagement in trade, obviously, and that the whole rationale behind TPP, as folks will know, was to, um, to uh, establish standards in the region that were consistent with what the US um, would typically champion. So the whole decision, not to revisit the last four years of history, but the, the decision of the Trump administration to pull out of that agreement um, really kind of flew in the face of what our broader geostrategic objectives are in Asia. I think that is still, you know, you talk to folks like me and others on this panel, um, from just a pure kind of economic geostrategic perspective, it makes all the sense in the world for the US to be back in the, what was TPP now, CPTPP. But then that hits up against the political realities in the United States. And so um, the administration thus far has been clear <laughs> that TPP and other trade agreements are not the priority right now. But the reality that I'm describing still exists. And I think folks know that. I think they will be, I think the question was asking if there might be some kind of below the radar screen attempt to, um, to at least advance some of the, um, the objectives that are included in TPP. And I think that's, that's absolutely the case. And in fact, some of the provisions of TPP um, are preserved in the form of another U.S. <laughs> trade agreement. So the, the revised NAFTA, the USMCA, actually took language from TPP and included that in the updated trade agreement. So I think there's every reason to believe that the content of what's in TPP um, will continue to be prioritized by the U.S. and that we'll look for opportunities to, um, to advance certain provisions in there, including on state-owned enterprises, including, including on the digital economy. And then the question is, <laughs> at what moment are we going to um, re-engage? And I, I hold out hope, uh, even though we're saying that we're not going back into CPTPP, um, I hold out hope that at some point we will see that it is in our best interest to do that. Um, I don't actually take China at its word when it says it's interested in joining TPP. I think the standards of that trade agreement are actually too high for China, but it has led and led an agreement on a lower uh, quality standard trade agreement in the RCEP, 
Um, and that should worry the US. I mean, they, they were able to forge consensus enough around that. Um, so we need to get back in the business of playing offense and hopefully we'll come back into TPP at some point. Great, uh, Gerwin, um, there's a lot of talk about FinTech these days, um, digital currencies, China making progress on central bank digital currencies, uh, what that means. I think a lot of the discussion is somewhat overblown, but be that as it may, um, maybe you could share some thoughts on, on that. Um, and uh, there was a question, I mean, despite all the tensions, it does seem that China has been trying to open up its financial markets mm -hmm. a bit over a year. Now, this is something we pushed for a decade and uh, it seems now that all the Chinese firms are developed and ensconced, now they're opening up a smidgen. Uh, but uh, how do you see that? Is there further prospects for opening to foreign firms? And do you think that foreign firms are really going to be able to get much of a foothold in the Chinese market? Right. These are, these are great questions, Mark, and, and they're actually quite, quite interlinked. But before there, I mean, you, you, you're discussing all kinds of bilateral and regional trade agreements. Um, I mean, the gold standard is still the, uh, the multilateral true multilateral uh, agreement. And, and I hope at one point people get around to uh, spare a thought for the WTO, which I think would be a, a major, major improvement and would have to Nolan's Lawrence uh, integrate China. Now on, on the FinTech uh, financial opening question. Um, China is actually a leader in, in FinTech. I think a lot of people don't, don't really know this, to what extent uh, you, know, you can pay with your phone uh, anywhere in, in, in China, you have multiple providers that do this. So that was one of the actually success stories in, 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 in Chinese uh, upgrading and technology. However, they have now run into a regulatory wall. And it started with the cancellation of the Ant Financial, the finance arm of Alibaba in December, but has since now bridged to uh, Baidu and, and Tencent. Now, there is a big systemic reason behind it. It's not that the Chinese don't like Jack Ma. I mean, he did nothing in December that he hadn't done the year before when he was in high state. What he has done, however, has pointed to the underlying fragility in the Chinese financial sector. And that got to an observation you made twice already, Mark. I mean, the very high share of debt and leverage in the system. That is not a problem because so far we have a lot of savings voluntary caught up savings also in the in the financial system. Now, it is key that they don't move out. So one way they could move out to is into uh, um, financial financial technology products, money market funds. Uh, that would deprive commercial banks of deposits that could then be used, no longer used to financial repress via, you know, uh, unattractive net interest margins, so to build bank, bank profits that then can over time uh, deal with the uh, non-performing loan uh, problem on their books. I think the Chinese realized this after Jack Ma diagnosed the uh, big uh, Chinese banks as essentially pawn shops. But I mean, they have a lot of collateral in the form of household deposits that they must not let go. So the last thing they want to have is see these household deposits wander away into the fintech sector. So I think that is one big overlooked uh, aspect of the uh, of the, uh, of the of the tighter regulation of financial technology. A key a key positive development. I mean, key positive technology sector in China. Now coming to foreign banks and foreign financial institutions. Well, you know. It probably you won't let them take over the, the banking sector too, because I mean they will be less inclined to, uh, to 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 take on the same level of bad debt or to have the same level of legacy bad debt. So, but I do think that that the Chinese are eager enough to hang this out as a carrot, particularly for the uh, for the US, and then a marginal expansion of US or, or international financial. Uh, players can also raise standards in the Chinese sector. So I, I think that that's okay and will happen. What really though worries me is this um, once again swelling uh, attempt in China to, to, to toward much greater capital account liberalization. Um, and I mentioned the, uh, the household deposits that are now trapped in the banks. 
Um, well, I mean, they could also leave the country. And we saw a foretaste of that in, in, in 2015 and 2016. Um, and if you look at the most recent balance of payments data, I mean, capital outflows are very, very large indeed in China. Again, though right now mitigated by, by, by inflows as Chinese bonds get, get into varying indices. But, um, you know, eventually the index uh, will be filled. And then you have to ask, is there, unless there's a handle on you know, some, some market-driven way to keep um, the Chinese uh, deposits on shore, that you're, you're opening a big, uh, a big, a big fragility uh, aspect in, in the whole Chinese model. So I, I hope there isn't that much of a rush to capital account opening, but I do see some prospect to uh, to further uh, uh, further access for foreign financial institutions on the on the onshore market. Thank you, and uh, you know it's IMF orthodoxy that. Uh, capital account liberalization should be gradual and sequenced. And when they say sequenced, they're meaning you need a strong banking system, which China doesn't have. Um, so I think that kind of reinforces your concerns. And of course, if there were a huge capital outflow, that would have implications for the RMB's value against the dollar, which is a whole other can of worms that I've spent uh, many years of my life uh, dealing with. Um, uh, Stephanie, uh, BRI lending was big. It's been curtailed uh, in recent years. Um, a lot of worries, especially in light of the pandemic about low-income country debt, um, the transparency thereof. Will China write down um, debts under the common framework? Um, do you have any thoughts for us on that? Yeah, I'd, we actually have a separate um, project embedded in the economics program at CSIS called Reconnecting Asia, which focuses very much on BRI. And I think um, the, the caution that Dave gave all of us against speaking and thinking about China as a monolith, I think is also appropriate when we talk about the BRI, even I think China itself um, kind of knitted together various projects under this BRI heading after the fact. So those projects kind of started off um, not necessarily associated under that umbrella. And, and now they are, but not all BRI projects are the same. Um, I think, you know, some, some of them and from the recipient country perspective, um, there's no question that there's the need for infrastructure investment. Um, and they are looking for investment from whoever is actually providing the financing. So China, as you mentioned, had been providing that financing, um, not always on the terms that were beneficial to the recipient countries and oftentimes not with the transparency that would be required for China to actually manage um, its overseas exposure and for the recipient countries to be able to manage their own finances. And it did in many cases contribute to debt buildup in a number of low and lower middle income countries. Um, so that to your question, China is a piece of a puzzle that also includes market participants contributing to growing indebtedness in a number of these countries. That indebtedness was an issue prior to the crisis um, and, and needed to be dealt with and was starting to be dealt with through um, transparency initiatives on the part of the bank and the, and the IMF. But now with the crisis and the fact that growth um, has really suffered in a number of these countries and their ability to respond through policy um, in the way that advanced economies have been able to, they are much more constrained and there is um, deservedly so a whole lot of concern about the debt sustainability of these countries. So there have been efforts, um, including through the G20 um, at debt suspension and now under a new framework to actually um, results in uh, debt restructuring. Those are those are good developments, but where they stand right now, I think the view is that they are insufficient, and the countries impacted really can't 
wait um, for uh, what will probably be protracted restructuring efforts. So there's additional help that's needed for these countries. Um, China needs to be among the countries that are providing that assistance. And I think China's participation in this common framework uh, for restructuring the debts is essential for these low-income countries to actually recover. Mark, can I jump in? Uh, I just this morning saw a really interesting report. It was by the Peterson Institute and William and Mary and a couple of other uh, groups. I don't C have it. CGD and the Keel Institute. I have to say yeah. CGT because one of my good buddies is uh, former colleagues is an author. Well, pass on my my compliments. It's a really interesting analysis yep. of uh, you know it's hard to get access to Chinese uh, uh, official lending in in uh, poorer countries. Uh, uh, analysis of the uh, of contracts signed between those countries and 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 Chinese banks, uh, and you know the transparent the lack of transparency in some of them. All of the things you know the sort of the anecdotally have been a concerns that Stephanie was talking about, uh, it, it, it uh, maps them out uh, fairly clearly. The problem is, in, in my mind, you, you talk to diplomats or officials from uh, recipient countries is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, the Chinese are putting forward BRI money. The US really doesn't have an alternative to that. And, and if your only choice is, is a, a not great deal, you're gonna take that not great deal. And that's where we are right now. Thank you for that. I was going to actually mention that uh, study. So, but I'm, I like I agree with you about uh, as Tim Geithner always would say, plan beats no plan, or crappy plan beats no plan. So, uh, um, all right. Well, let me just ask one last question. Uh, time is running out. Um, but uh, Stephanie talked a bit about engagement. Um, uh, you know, the, the rhetoric is pretty fraught between uh, both sides now, but in the past, uh, and Stephanie and I worked on this, uh, there was the SED under Hank Paulson, then there was the SNED under Geithner and um, Clinton, and we brought all the high-level people from the agencies together. Um, I did, a, I asked a bunch of uh, experts, uh, including Stephanie, uh, a few months ago, what do they think we should do in the future. And I think the general consensus back was that the engagement uh, of the SNED type was too high level. It didn't really allow for technical discussions. It focused too much on deliverables um, at the expense of kind of understanding and uh, better day-to-day -day, uh, expert uh, discussions. So any thoughts for a process on engagement uh, going forward? Do you um, is it just going to be very high level bickering or can we get to some deeper technical discussions where uh, we might be able to find greater scope for cooperation here and there? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll end with the order in which we started. So Dave, Stephanie, Gerwin. I, I will start off with a sort of high level. I mean, this is sort of like Gerwin, your comment on the Chinese economy that it's growing, but from a very low baseline. Uh, I think we will see more engagement uh, than we saw in the past four years, just because it's at such a low baseline. But you know, one of the the very clear messages coming out of the Alaska meetings was the Chinese were saying, "Oh, we're back to engagement," and the Americans saying, "This is not a process. This is a meeting. We're not interested in meeting for the sake of meeting. You know, we'll do it when it's when uh, we need to have uh, dialogue, but we're not going to get back into the SED, SNED, uh, dog and pony show." Uh, I, you know, I actually have a slightly contrary view on the value of the SNED and the SED. Uh, and, and Mark, your comment about it was too focused on deliverables. I thought it was actually pretty effective in not in the central areas where we have these big fundamental disagreements. And it's hard to, I mean, the problem wasn't that we weren't talking. The problem is that we just disagreed and we, we weren't going to get to yes. But in some of the uh, sort of uh, outer, the penumbra of the relationship, uh, of you know the the second tier issues that otherwise wouldn't get attention in the Chinese system. You had a very senior person directly uh, uh, nominated by the the Chinese leadership who could cut through bureaucratic processes and get decisions that you you we would not have been able from the U.S. side uh, to have gotten uh, uh, in, in any other mechanism. So. You know, it left the big fundamental, the issues that you noted uh, as problems, we, we didn't resolve them. But I think that was probably not so much a problem of structure as a problem of just, we have really different interests and values. Stephanie. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to repeat what I heard a, a senior U.S. government official say, which is that um, substance um, uh, will have to dictate form. Um, so I, I think the focus in the Biden administration, at least, is very much on the substance. Um, and they're not going to allow kind of the pageantry to get in the way of making real progress on some of the substance. And I, I don't think that's a, a null set either of issues. Um, Secretary Blinken was, was clear to enumerate uh, a few, including North Korea, obviously climate. I think there's probably scope on pandemic response, even though that has also been fraught. Um, but there are absolutely issues where the US and China have to work together. Um, and I think there's an appreciation for that. I also think um, there is an appreciation that it might be easiest to work kind of multilaterally, again, not just to apply pressure, but it also helps with the kind of the political, the optics of being too friendly with China when we actually do need to work with them on some issues. Great, we, we should also cooperate on global economic and financial stability where we all have a common interest as well. Gerwin, the last word. Yeah, oh boy, no, I completely agree with you and Stephanie. I mean, and, and there are on a multilateral context, there are certainly things that the Chinese would really benefit working for us. And one thing is this common framework, a low income debt relief. I don't think that will rile much political opposition. But there's the chance for China to learn from our experience of 40 years of combined London and Paris club and do it much cleaner. It would also under, under kind of unnoticed here, but very much noticed in Beijing, be a severe rebuke to uh, Xi Jinping's ambitions of developing the Chinese model that I don't think will go away, uh, go, go unnoticed. Now, one thing that I do worry though, and that's just as an economist boring about things you don't understand. This constant all-side onslaught on China right now. Um, you know, the, the Chinese will bite their time, but they're not going to sit there and take it. And, and the most worrisome scenario is one where, where the Chinese actually share my view that, I mean, it's really not given that they will cruise to supremacy this uh, century and then end up in a, in a use it or lose it situation. So we have, and we really have an interest working with them, with the Chinese leadership, with the Chinese people on mutually important and perceived problems and, and kind of tone down things that are not really that, that essential. Well, great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I will wrap up uh, by thanking Dave, Stephanie, and Gerwin for a fantastic uh, panel, very insightful. I learned a lot. I hope our audience enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. You're all welcome to come back anytime. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. What a great, great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mike. It.